We're going to get started with our Hacker School launch. Thank you for joining in. Uh, this video has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel at Code for Fun. Um, so uh, my name is Servan Demol, and I'm very glad to uh, be launching the second semester of Hacker School uh, with a, a tons of projects that the students have been working on and they'll be presenting very soon. So first of all, uh, what is Haikai School? Uh, well, Haikai School was created in 2018-2019 with the, the collaboration of Ecole 42 that was in Fremont at the time. And it was really aiming to, get, to give more opportunities for high school students to be able to learn a little bit of coding and discover what it was. And then we didn't want to replicate the high school experience. So we wanted to bring in mentors who were in the industry and really make sure that the students learn from each other, which is kind of the tactic in Ecole 42 and uh, their philosophy. And so we launched this um, at that time. And then after COVID, we switched to online. Um, we are really uh, happy. We had about 25 students there all over the world. Um, so that's great. They're joining you today from, uh, from different parts of, of the world. And you can see that they're splitting in, uh, among different grades, but mainly 10th and 11th graders. Uh, in the beginning, high school, we had a lot of 9th graders because they were not able to access computer science classes, usually reserved for a little bit uh, older kids. But now we have a, a good disparity. As you can see, we also have a good balance of income. So we, this is the reason why we want to keep this program tuition free um, because uh, some of uh, our students will not be able to access such an opportunity. Um, however, it does cost us money. So if you are able to, you can certainly make a contribution to Good for Fun. We are a nonprofit organization and that would be greatly appreci appreciated so we can continue such projects and such programs. Uh, to welcome everyone. A little bit about uh, some people who have gone through uh, Code for Fun uh, uh, High School in the past. Um, as you can see, we started in 2018 and um, a lot of programs uh, in school did not have the APCSP available for students. And so we offered this and we had a lot of people uh, who took this, uh, uh, this APCSP uh, as a um, uh, you know, as a uh, advanced placement test on the on the side, not through the school, but they prepared it with us. Um, even one of our mentor today, Sahil, is uh, started like that with us. But we also had Linea, who actually created a, a very great game. We had v Violetta, who actually created an application in Spectigo for her, her dad's business. And she actually went and compete uh, presenting that particular application. Uh, Kabir also um, uh, joined us uh, when he was in ninth and in 10th grade and, and last semester he was a mentor. And then uh, Emmanuel, who is today with us, uh, is also a mentor, but he started um, with high school in the past. His parent event uh, supported him and, and mentored and became mentor for high school. And Emmanuel also spoke at, uh, at one of our events and uh, it, it was really great. So thank you, Emmanuel, for all your, all your work with us. Um, as you can see, we have had 500 students going through high school until today. So we're really proud of us and this will never be possible without the help of the mentor. Uh, so I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, all the mentors who have been able to help us throughout this journey and especially the mentors who are sitting here today. You're going to hear a little bit more about them when the uh, students are presenting the project. Um, so again, you know, we are, we would like to continue this project and, uh, you know, it goes by semesters. So if you know about, uh, if anybody you know in your entourage is able to help us in any way, uh, it doesn't have to be Benin, but it could also be um, becoming a mentor if you're in the industry or you're studying computer science and you're interested in helping a group of four or five students to learn something that you, uh, that you do in your work offline, uh, in your line of work, then you know, please let us know and uh, contact us. All right, so we're going to get into um, the presentation. We'll go to uh, build your PC and then we'll come back to Python game design afterwards. 
who would like to start? Sahil, do you have an order for your students? Uh, yes, uh, we're, we're doing Khaled first and then... Okay. Yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, hi, I'm Calvin Chu and I was part of the Build a PC division. So the team was uh, my mentor, Sahil, who has been a mentor at Hack High School for I think, three years. And he taught APCSP and PC building. And then it's me, uh, Calvin Chu. Uh, I've been a high school student for two years and my interest aside from CS is in robotics. So my project was to assemble a PC and learn about its different components and the process of assembly and setup. And by the end of the project, I should have a working PC. And so for the demonstration, a video demonstration of the PC working. Okay, and some technical aspects of this project was uh, mainly separated into three parts. It was the planning, the assembly, and then the Windows installation and driver setup. And for resources we used for the planning, it was the PC Part Picker tool. And then for the assembly in Windows installation and drivers, uh, it was mainly under the guidance of our mentor, uh, Sahil. So thank you for helping me with that. Uh, some technical challenges I faced uh, mostly was one reoccurring issue was that the case was too small. Uh, first, it was the power supply, which the dimensions did fit in the slot. However, it made it almost impossible to wire it correctly because the hard drive cage was in the way. And so the solution for that was just removing the hard drive cage entirely because I opted to use an SSD instead of a hard drive. And then the fan controller, which uh, Sahil initially instructed me to attach into the back, did not fit there. And so I had to move it inside, which made the wiring like a lot messier. Uh, one of the key features of this project was the budget uh, or budget management. Since this was my first experience with personal computers, I decided on a lower end budget of around $1,200. and uh, the project overall ended up being a bit more expensive as there are additional tools needed for the assembly. Managing this budget uh, involved determining uh, which parts uh, were more cost efficient since, uh, sorry, uh, which parts were more cost efficient, obviously since I'm using a lower budget. And I also had to balance that with personal choice in which parts I wanted to invest more in. And this brings us to my, the next key feature of the project, which was optimization. Since knowing how I'm going to use the computer is important for effective budget management. Uh, since I'm interested in robotics, I wanted to be able to run CAD software on this PC since my current laptop struggles with that. And so I did research on the hardware specifications for running uh, CAD software, as well as which components I should invest more in. And I found that uh, investing more in the CPU and processing speed was important since CAD software requires doing lots of uh, computations in order to make the models mathematically accurate. And so during this research, I also learned about overclocking, uh, which would allow me to increase the processing speed uh, in exchange for additional heat. So for this product, the final product was the PC itself. And other results were that I learned the skills necessary to assemble one in the future and upgrade it. Uh, in this product, I learned a lot about the different components of PC and the process of building it, not only the assembly, 
but also the research that goes into picking out the correct parts and also how to manage it like overclocking. I also learned lessons in communication and time management as it was uh, required to coordinate in-person meetings to build the PC. Additionally, later in the semester, it became difficult to attend the usual Saturday meetings. And so I had to schedule additional time to work on the PC. So thank you for uh, thank you to Sahil for meeting me during the week uh, when I needed to work on it additionally. And I think uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Calvin. Do you have any question for Calvin? Okay, we will go to Tia now. So I also was in PC building with Calvin. And so I'm going to be talking about my PC building experience. Hi, my name is Tia Nair. So in my team, there was, of course, Sahil, my mentor, who was originally part of um, Coach for Fun's Hack High School in the APCSP program. And then he did three years of mentoring he was first in the APCSP as a mentor. He was also the Discord manager for high, Hack High School. And then finally, he's also in the PC, he's also a PC building mentor. And then the other person in the team was me. I'm a sophomore, sophomore at uh, MBHS. And uh, this is my first semester at Hack High School. So the goals of the project. Um, obviously, I wanted to build a, P, a gaming PC. Um, Cal so there was like two different PCs you could build, like a programming PC um, that's more catered toward rendering and like 3D modeling. Um, and so that was what Calvin did, but I wanted to get a PC for gaming. Um, so I wanted to learn what components I needed and um, uh, I learned a lot about the different gaming parts and brands. Uh, the second goal was to understand the specifications of the PC parts. Um, so how to read um, and how to compare and find which one's better um, when comparing the two parts. And then there was also uh, building the PC. Uh, this was more of a long-term goal, which started, um, I started the goal, the, sorry, the, um, the plan a year ago. I was able to get a job last year, so I balanced my own budget. And it was only in September um, that I joined Hack High School, um, thankfully, because I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And uh, Sahil helped me with my PC building experience. So the steps of the project were, I joined Hack High School, and so we drafted our parts list on Part Picker. Uh, we then ordered the parts from home, um, and once everything had arrived, we met at the Code for Fun headquarters where we built together, um, installed everything apart from the BIOS and the operating system, and then we brought the PCs back home, and then we, um, and then we installed the BIOS in the operating system. Uh, this is a picture of the finished product without the cases front. Um, so those are just all my parts and all the wiring was yet to be done because it's very new. So this is a demonstration of the end product. So this is uh, this is at home, it's underneath my desk right now. Um, so yeah, this is my PC and I'm just turning it on right here. Um, so, Everything's running. And now I'm going to show the monitors. There we go. Uh, some of the main components. So we have my CPU, which is, I got an AMD Ryzen 7 59,000, um, which is this right here. Um, my Asus ROG B450 uh, F Gaming 2, which is my motherboard. This is um, this right here. I also, I haven't, I don't have a picture of this, uh, of my storage, but I also got a two terabyte um, Saber and Rocket, which is my SSD. And then I also got a hard drive, which is also two terabytes, uh, the Seagate, Seagate Barracuda Compute. And then finally, um, the pièce de résistance is my graphics card, uh, the NVIDIA 3070, which is this right here. Uh, I actually only learned this afterwards, but I didn't get Wi-Fi, um, 
I didn't get Wi-Fi or Bluetooth was added into my motherboard. So I'm still, I'm getting a separate uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi adapter to help with that. Um, if there's one thing that I could redo um, that I would change is that I would not get this motherboard. Um, but, you know, it, it was, um, it was just um, a mistake I made on my first PC building, um, my first build. Um, and then finally, there was the, the chassis fans, which were originally supposed to be um, RGB, but um, I realized only later that I was supposed to get a fan controller and everything. So I opted to not uh, input the RGB um, on my on my fans. Um, if I were to do it again, I would probably get um, the Corsair uh, fan kit, where you can actually install an app on your computer and then control it from there rather than needing a remote controller. So, some key features in my build. I have my LED CPU cooler, which you saw for a split second in the video. Um, so, it's actually this one on the right. And the reason why it's a bit more different than uh, regular CPU coolers is because usual CPU coolers are this, are, uh, the ones on the left, which they're actually going to be sitting on top of the CPU, and then the fan will be um, pushing air downwards. Um, this, this fan cooler actually inputs, takes air uh, from the sides and then inputs it downwards. Um, and the cool thing about this is that I don't have this, I don't have it added, but I do have the ability to get another fan and put it on the back side right here. So it's just, so it's just more, um, it cools quicker. And it's also LED. Um, another key feature that I have is my storage. So um, in gaming computers, people love to have storage. Um, it's always something that people want more of. So I actually have four terabytes of storage, which is a lot. And I'm really happy about that. I have two on my SSD and two on my hard drive. All right, so in my final product, um, so before I had a laptop, um, which I only got 60 FPS on, um, and which basically motivated me even more to get a gaming PC because now I get like uh, 500 frames per second. That's what FPS is. Um, and it's really, really fun for um, frames per second demanding games like first-person shooters and uh, things like that. Some takeaways that I got from uh, this uh, experience was I learned how to balance a budget. Uh, it was a very new experience for me, um, and I'm, but I'm really happy I did it. And I also now learned how to build a PC. I know how to upgrade and compare my components, um, which is definitely going to be really, really um, important in the future. Thank you so much for listening. I would like to say once more a big thanks to my mentor, Sahil, because um, without him, I probably would have messed up about a dozen times. And thanks to him, um, I was able to um, have a really, really fun uh, experience. So thank you so much, Sahil. Excellent. Um, thank you, guys. So that was the uh, Build Your PC group. Uh, now we're going to go back to um, the Python game design. And I believe Digita is uh, ready to go. Um, we're the Python group and we're doing the snake game. This is our team and we want to give thanks to everyone in it for, especially our mentor, Harsha, for uh, helping us finish this project because we really wouldn't be able to done it without him. Um, uh, our project was we made a snake game that users could play for entertainment purposes. So the green um, square that's moving is the snake, while the red is square is the food. So every time the snake reaches the food, the score at the top increases by one, and the snake increases in length by one block. When the snake reaches a certain length and it uh, collides with itself, it will um, it will close down the game. The snake currently isn't long enough yet, so um, I'll just. Yeah, so the snake would then, um, sorry, the game would shut down basically, just like how the Google game would work. Um, another component of this thing is if the snake goes out of bounds from the screen here, it will also close down the game. Um, okay, so we we each different did different parts of it. So I created the snake 
um, made it move, um, had the snake and the food spawn over in positions and created the score count. And then we both did final cleanup. Uh, so I created the food and I defined boundaries for the snake. I also made sure that the snake could increase in length when it eats food. And once that's done, the food would respawn. And I also did the final cleanup. Oh, um, okay, so what is Pygame? Pygame is a Python-based library which is filled with different modules that can be used for developing 2D video games and other multimedia programs. So one of our challenges was that the snake wasn't eating um, the food properly and the size would increase uh, correctly because the snake was a circle. It would work more as like a balloon expanding rather than how we kind of wanted it to work. So our solution was that we added a range on the food and it changed the snake and we changed it, the snake into a rectangle. When the snake was in a certain range um, over the food, it would increase in length, but it would only increase in one direction. And this, um, this the reason for this is because we used a variable to increase the length. Um, the second challenge was that the snake wasn't increasing in the length properly. Okay, it was only um, going in one direction. So it moved more like a block than how we actually wanted it to move. Um, so for a solution, we made the snake into an array and just added a rectangle onto the snake, onto the end of the snake every time I ate a food. One of our features was that to um, how the snake was moving. So um, it's a basic snake. Um, it's uh, what's made up of squares and it moves with like arrow keys. Um, it, the snake gets longer once it eats food, and the snake also um, makes um, turns as a real snake rather than a virtual snake. Um, okay, so the second key feature would be the food and snake interaction. So the food needed to be drawn first and then respawn in a different place after the snake ate it, and it has to increase in length after eating the food as shown here. Um, our uh, final product is basically, we created a one player game and it keeps uh, the score of how many uh, food that you eat um, and it's relatively engaging. So some next steps that we could do is we could create different levels of difficulty and other criteria to make the game more challenging. We could create a website that'll provide entertainment to a wider community of people we could have a scoreboard so uh, other players can compete with each other, and we could do more comprehensive testing, which is basically unit testing. Um, so takeaways and learning, we both learned how to use like visual code, uh, improved Python skills, and learned the Pygame library and learned how to use GitHub. Uh, so visual code was like new to both of us, so we had to learn how to set it up, navigate it. Um, Pygame. Uh, both of us also hadn't used Pygame before, so we had to download it and we learned a few basic commands. GitHub, uh, we had to learn how to collaborate with other people using GitHub, and we learned basic commands like pull, push, and commit. Thank you for listening. Thank you guys and uh, thank you for Arsha uh, for uh, to be the mentor for this uh, for this group. So I would add one more challenge to this group is that we had a, uh, we had a little difficulty finding a person to mentor this group. So Arsha came in a few weeks after we started the semester and uh, I really want to thank him for stepping up and helping the students who were interesting in Python game design. So a big thank you. So we made it happen and we have a project launch now. Uh, the next is uh, Cameron's group and uh, they focused on robotics. Uh, so Cameron, who, who is uh, presenting? Um, Harsha will show the slides. I can quickly start too. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, so yeah, we're the robotics team. I'm Cameron, I'm the mentor. Um, I'm super proud of what these guys did. Um, they came in pretty much beginners at programming and electronics. And I'm pretty confident they could both go off and do their own projects now. So 
Um, yeah, but I won't talk for long. I'll pass it over to Harsha and both of these guys to explain the project. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Harsha Manamala. I'm one of the team members along with Satvik. Uh, so I'm a freshman in high school in the Bay Area, and I like to make projects and work on things that are in the tech industry. Good morning, everyone present in the meeting. I'm Satvik Roshan, the team member in robotics. I worked with Harsha and Cameron to make our robot. I'm a junior student who is interested in programming and building projects. Uh, so this is our pitch for the robot. So when we were designing the robot, we had a few constraints that we wanted. So the first thing that we wanted to build was an easy to build affordable remote exploring bot. However, there were a few problems. We wanted it to be cheap, so less than $70 USD so that everyone could build it. We also wanted commonly used parts that, that would be easy to get and easy to use. We want it to be easy to build so that you could learn with it and not much ex prior experience was needed. We also wanted to use any smartphone, Android or iOS to control it over the internet to make sure we knew which direction it would go. We also wanted to allow more students to learn about robotics and we wanted it to be an interesting and useful DIY project. So here you can look at our robot, which is made by using basic parts such as a battery pack. We have used four diesel motors uh, to control our wheels. We have a motor controller to change the direction. And we do have a servo arm to grab things for us. And this robot is controlled by ESP32 microcontroller, which has a camera. So we can stream video from it. Uh, so when we were designing the ideas for the project, we had two ideas, each of one came up with one. My idea was a trash bot, which would use a motor controller, microcontroller, and any chassis that we could find on the internet. We would decide to build it, and then we would use a soft, we code the software so for the gripper, the microcontroller, and the camera technology. So like Sotvik said, we could stream it over Wi-Fi. So my project idea was a security bot which we can monitor, uh, actually, we can use to monitor the security in our area. And I helped in listing the paths and I figured out how to build the robot. I worked with Hersha and Cameron to build software web interface. So this is more of the technical side of things. For hardware, we decided to go with an ESP32 cam microcontroller. It was very small, so it's easy, easy to use, and it wasn't too heavy, so it wouldn't weigh down the motors. It also had a built-in camera so we could stream. For software, we used GitHub to share the code to each other so we could pull, push, and, com and like uh, commit stuff to the main branch. We used VS Code and the extension for platform IO to code in C++ or Arduino on VS Code. And for some libraries, we had to look on the internet to find libraries for the camera the web server and motor driver, but some of these didn't work, so we had to modify it to work with our parts. So here, this picture describes the circuit diagram of our robot. This shows how we connected the components together. Battery pack is connected to the motor driver and motor driver is connected to the motor. Server grabs the things and everything is controlled by ESP32 CAM. So when we were making this, we faced a few technical challenges. Some of these were the programming, the motor driver, the web server, servo gripper, and power supply. For the programmer, our board was very small, so we had to get an external programmer to plug it into our PCs to be able to code. The wiring was very easy to mix up and we faced a lot of wiring issues. For the motor driver, it was designed to work with an Arduino Uno, which is a much bigger, beefier microcontroller. We had to manually wire and write our library to be able to use it to control the motors. For the web server, we had a few issues connecting to Wi-Fi where the ESP would suddenly shut down and not be able to connect. We also had a few issues finding the IP address as the code for it was sometimes not working, as well as I had an issue where my firewall would block connection so I was not able to upload through Wi-Fi. For the servo gripper, we actually ran out of pins on the ESP32 cam because it's such a small board, so we were unable to code it and use it. 
As for the power supply, whenever we were on USB power, we would get a brownout issue, so we needed to use batteries, but it turns out those batteries didn't have enough voltage to power all four motors at full speed. And so uh, this is just a quick video of the bot. So here I have my postman, which is basically, it's how I send codes uh, wirelessly to the bot. So whenever I send a command on postman, the bot will respond to it. So that was just a demo of our project. And if we could go further, we would just make it so that we could have a better power source so this bot could actually drive around and move as we wanted it to. And we have the following learnings from this project we have made. We have learned that debugging and problem solving, we know uh, we had gained a little bit knowledge of code libraries we had learned how to design electron modules circuits from camera. And we have a very easy module ESP32 cam was a good model, but it was very difficult to pro for programming because it does not have a programming mode coming with it. And I finally want to thank my mentor for having his time for us and help help us to do this wonderful project. Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Uh, we didn't know a lot when we came into this, but you helped us a lot, and then we made this together. So, thank you. Also, uh, thank you for listening. That concludes our presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you, everyone, for having us. Yep. Please, you really may important. ask any questions if you have. Thank you. Uh, so this is a, a good demonstration of how things can be made possible when we are uh, working on two different continents, but with Discord and uh, a mentor who has dedicated all of his Saturdays to work with those two students. Um, it's kind of nice to see two bots being built at a very different part of the, of the planet, but they are uh, collaborating onto the same project. So uh, good job, guys. Um, the next and final group is the artificial intelligence uh, group uh, who was mentored by Emmanuel. This is the AI 2022 presentation group. Um, this is their presentation on the electrocardiogram prediction uh, sequence. And they will be presenting this for you guys today. Uh, hello, my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I was the mentor for this group. I'm currently a senior in high school. Uh, in Mopitas, and it's been an absolute joy working with these these four students uh, over the past few months. And my name is Mia. I am a junior in high school. I'm in Irvington High School, and yeah, it was amazing working with everyone on this project this year. Hello, and my name is Jeffrey Wu, and I am from Mission San Jose High School, and I am a junior. Hi, I'm Darcy, and I'm a senior from American High School. Hi, I'm Patrick, and I'm from high school in Bratislava, Europe, and I'm in Olamant, Crete. So the problem statement of our project is that we were trying to use data from different electrocardiograms provided from Kegel, and we attempt to classify different heartbeat types using machine learning algorithms, and in a way, just diagnosing um, something that a, a regular doctor would, so. Data is one of the most important components of any AI program, and we collect data through a process called sampling, 
Um, so we essentially gather data from a part of the population. Um, however, the type and quantity of data are crucial as well. Um, often there are cases of bias in data collection where the information doesn't represent the majority of the population. Um, an example of this is under coverage or convenience sampling where the data perhaps only represents a very small um, specific part of the population rather than the population as a whole. And this happens when we have too little data. Um, another issue that we come across is overfitting when the program um, in simple terms gets so used to the data used for training that it doesn't work with unfamiliar data, even though it can be 100% accurate with the training data. So how do we avoid bias? So starting with minimizing under coverage, it's as simple as using random samples. So every member of the population has a chance of being selected and therefore represented. Um, as for minimizing potential for overfitting, there are a couple of ways to achieve this. First is cross-validation, where you use uh, different portions of the data to test and train the model. And this ensures that all the data isn't used entirely for training, which can cause the program to fail when it encounters new data. Um, second is early stopping, which like in the name is when we stop the model's training before it completely memorizes the training data. And this makes sure that it gets to a point where um, it can still learn from the training data while working with other data as well. And lastly, just training with more data helps since there's a larger variety of data for the algorithm to work with. So we coded up our algorithm in Python and we use data from MIT Arrhythmia dataset and PTB diagnostic ECG dataset. And we used various libraries in Python, like a scikit-learn or scikit-learn, which is which we used for classifying our model and scoring scoring it. We also use Keras, which is built on TensorFlow, which is AI and um, machine learning library developed by Google. We used Pandas for reading data set from CSV files and NumPy for doing array operation on our data. And finally, we used Matplotlib for visualization of data. All right, and I'm just going to have a quick overview of the convolutional neural network. So obviously it starts with a basic structure of a neural network with an input layer, hidden layer, output layer, but um, I'm not gonna go deeper. I think Darcy will go deeper on that. Um, and then what makes it a convolutional neural network is the convolutional layer, which allows us to find patterns anywhere at once. Um, in a better way to think, visualize it, it just finds what's interesting about the image and it uses that and tries to, try to find exactly where in the image, um, and which like basically which pattern is best fitting for um, a certain image. And then we also have a pooling layer, which helps reduce overfitting by reducing uh, dimensions. And this way we can get rid, we can focus on like the broader concept, the broader aspects of a certain image so that it would not necessarily focus on like minimal details that can distract the, um, can distract the AI. And then we do this with different kernels, in other words, different patterns. And in this way, we can find different di diagnoses. So how convolutional layer works? So it works by passing filter over the image or data that we have. And that creates another 
image which contains which is calculated that by multiplicative sum of all values that filter pass passed by and after that on this new array or new image we did max pooling so for each four pixels and we we get max oh i'm sorry so con how convolutional layer works so it works by passing filter over the image and doing multiplicative sum so uh, multiplying each pixel of image in that space three times three by pixel of by pixel in filter and creating new image containing containing data after that which is represented by sum of numbers by multiplication so then after that we pull we did pooling on this layer so we took biggest number from each four points as you can see in left image and this reduces um, spatial complexity of our image but it keeps positional arrangements of features which is important and last thing in one layer is normalization or batch normalization which works by which works on each batch so each but which works on 32 samples in training process and it converts them from random distribution to normal distribution so the model can learn more quickly and also it would have better results next i will be um, briefly explaining for propagation um, pro uh, for propagation is uh, one of the processes used to um, pro process data and so and forward propagation uh, moves data in only one direction. And this is very specific, um, which is different than backwards propagation. And it basically moves sequentially through the input layer to the hidden layer and then to the output layer. It is the calculation of store uh, and storage of intermediate variables for a neural network. And we will explain a bit more about the hidden layers next. The hidden layer is a layer between the input and the output layers. Um, it consists of two functions, the pre-activation function and the activation function. So first, the pre-activation function calculates the weighted sum of inputs from the previous layer. And the activation function uses the weighted sum um, to decide whether the artificial neuron or node should be activated for the next layer. Um, this makes the network nonlinear and learn as the computation progresses. And the default activation function and the one that we used is called ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Activation Unit. So backwards propagation takes place after each batch of samples. So after 32 data samples and it works by finding which parameters had negative effects on our results so if we gave it a data with normal distribution and it predicted it as unknown we can find out which neurons and which parameters of that neurons had the biggest effect on that result and we can adjust them so the result would be 
closer to what we expected. This adjustment is this adjustment isn't big because that could ruin other results. It's only small push cl closer to the optimal optimal settings. And basically this is where the algorithm learns. Um, here we have our results um, from the model and we can see um, the confusion, confusion matrix on the right. And we can also see how, um, I guess the biggest uh, mistake that came up with our model is that it sometimes confuses the superventricular topic feet with a normal um, feet. But overall, our, the program was pretty accurate. All right, and now onto the ethics of AI and specifically this project. So we want to, as we said before, we want to always try to have the best data sets. However, there's still going to be uh, bias in data sets, no matter how we, no matter how we edit it and try to make it like we try to normalize it and we try to you know balance it out. There's always going to be some things left out. So um, like if, for instance, if there is a system with only white males as data, then it'd be terrible for black males. Um, for predicting data for the black males and vice versa. It's, um, you know, obviously we're going, we would have to make sure, like, like triple check, make sure that everyone is represented and not simply a certain um, group, a certain majority. And another portion of the ethics of this project is whether we can rely on the computer for diagnosis that can be life and death situations. So, I, I mean, that's obviously like, might be exaggerating, but still, um, it's still, uh, you know, you don't want to be scared thinking that you might have a certain condition when you really don't, right? Um, so it really raises the question, um, how accurate does AI need to be for real world application as, you know, we don't want false positives and true negatives popping up, um, which, you know, could definitely like make, make the use of this AI obsolete. So. Kind of to summarize, our project was um, to categorize different heartbeats using uh, machine learning, and uh, this. And while uh, we did do our program, there were also many other things that we did learn through this process, including sampling bias, neural networks, as well as the ethics of machine learning. So we hope you enjoyed our presentation, and we really want to thank our mentor. Um, Emmanuel, as well as Code for Fun for giving us this opportunity, and all of you guys for listening to our presentation. Thank you so much. Very well done, guys. This is uh, another example of how we can assemble people on an international, international level um, to make a project come, uh, come true. So thank you very much, Emmanuel, for leading this group of students. Congratulations to everyone for finishing your, uh, your presentation and your product. I know that the second semester at Haikai School is always a little bit more complex um, because we have finals coming up, AP testing. Um, and so I know that the, the students have had a bit of more of a hard time to meet on Saturday and prepare, uh, but they did it. So congratulations. And I was just, uh, again, a special thanks to all of our volunteers. So not only the mentor, but we also have people who help uh, run the program um, on the Saturday just to make sure that everybody is meeting. Uh, so Kevish, thank you for that. Um, Cameron, Sahil, Emmanuel, and Arsha, thank you for uh, helping our students learn and make them learn to all together. Um, we could not do this without, um, you know, without mentors. This is the force and this is the character of the program that we want to go in the industry and find people who have something to share, who are passionate about what they're doing and they want to share it with other students. And so if you know anyone or if you are yourself in the possibility of doing this, I think this is the best way for students to be able to learn from somebody who, in the, who has the expertise and is in the field. 
So don't hesitate and go to our website and the volunteering section if you would like to participate. Um, we love to have alumni of high uh, school come back. So if you're um, a senior and you're going to university next year and you continue learning and you think that you, know, you want to give back to Code for Fun for all of you've done during high school, we will be very glad to have you because you know the system, you know how this works and you can help a few students doing the same thing as you, what you did. Um, please, uh, we would like to thank all the people who have donated this year uh, in order to support this program. Um, there are some, even though the Build Your PC group did go ahead and buy their own parts, uh, we did help the robotics group to get their, their own uh, equipment, uh, which was, kind of tricky because we are very used to Amazon over here in this country, but in India, it's a little different. So there was, uh, that was also a learning curve for, for us. And, uh, but this is possible because people are able to donate some of our, uh, some money and, uh, and help us and support this program. And uh, we are very, very proud of what the, the students are able to do. And we really would like to continue and give this opportunity to everyone, as many as, uh, as, as we can. And so um, don't hesitate to support us if you can. Uh, a past event, and I'm going to paste this, uh, this YouTube um, link into, uh, into the chat. But uh, last year, last semester, we also had uh, Richard born after the end of our Akai school. He had a, a very nice lecture that was done for high school students. And uh, we recorded this lecture and uh, it's in AI. He's a professor um, at, uh, uh, of neuro, neurobiology at Harvard. And uh, it was very nice. So I'm, I'm giving it to you guys so that you can go ahead and, and watch it on our YouTube channel. Um, again, this is some of the ways that we are able to help students to enrich and discover different topics. And um, I'm, sure I'm going to send uh, Professor Bourne our, the, this presentation because I think it will be very, very interesting with what the AI group has done. So that's pretty much it. Thank you for attending today. Thank you all the students for your hard work and for the, and the mentors. Um, and thank you for all of our supporters to make this, uh, uh, help us make this program possible. And off to a nice summer, and it is graduation time. So this is also graduation time for Haikai School. So we hope that you have a safe and a very good summer. And we'll see you, some of you in September. Thank you. <laughs>